Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us so that by your grace we may believe your holy word and live holy lives according to it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have not read Matthew 18, please do so right now and, and you can join me. Okay, are you back? And, and also, if you would, you know, take a look at Psalm 51, Psalm 34, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, Genesis 50, 15 through 21. I won't be referring to those so, too much, but I want to go through Matthew 18 and make sure at least we're on the same page. Uh, because there's, you know, two hands with this message, and, you know, one of which I feel very confident that I'm standing on very solid ground. Uh, the other, I'm standing on very shaky ground where it's like, the practical application of this is something where I feel like I'm going to be doing this and pointing the finger and condemning and say, as God and Christ forgave you, so you must forgive others. And we pointing the finger with condemnation. And I would rather this, the, the unsure part be more of a conversation where you, we, we talk with each other as a church family and say, you know, God and Christ forgave us. Don't we want to offer that same forgiveness, that same grace, that, that same reconciliation that God has done for us in Christ Jesus by his death and resurrection? Don't we want everyone around us to experience that forgiveness of sins? Okay. Because that's the sure ground that I'm standing on. The, you know, the one hand, on the one hand, God has wiped the record clean. God has forgiven your sins. Every bad thing that you ever have done or ever will do. You know that thing that you did where you kind of go, ew, I hope no one ever finds out about that. I don't want to ever say that to anyone. God wipes it clean in Christ Jesus. He wipes the record of guilt and sin away. Absolutely with total certainty. And then on the other hand, as God has done for us, so also... We want others to experience that as well through us because we're God's chosen instruments. So here, here's, a, here's a cool thing about God. You know, God never sends an angel to do what a human can do. At least uh, find me a place in the Bible where, you know, an angel does something a human could have done. So I want to run through Matthew chapter 18, and hopefully you'll be able, you know, you have your Bible in front of me and you can stick with me. So Matthew 18, uh, his disciples asked the question in, in verse one, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing. It's talking about the rule of God on earth, you know, as God rules in heaven. So we pray, let your kingdom come on earth, okay? So who's the greatest? And his disciples, of course, are thinking in terms of worldly power, uh, the worldly exercise of power and, and coercion. And, and Jesus says, unless you turn, there's, there's a great word for how I would translate repent, turn, turn or return, turn and become like children. Okay? And then you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, here we come into a problem uh, with understanding what does Jesus mean when he says, become like a child? And we, with our Western mindset, we put it through our cultural filter, and this always gets me into trouble. And all I can say is, uh, okay, you know, do think about this. Jesus was not looking at children through a Western lens. So anything that you, you say about children that comes from Western thought is wrong, most likely. So if you say, Oh, you have to become cute like children or innocent like children. <clears throat> and if you say children are innocent, I kind of go, what child do you know? Children are not innocent. They bring their corruption with them. All right. uh, or they say, you know, children, oh, they're so trusting. Uh, you know, all that may or may not be true. I, I don't know. What I do know is how Jesus, in his culture, looked at children. Uh, children were without status. Uh, they, they had no value. Okay. The, yeah, now, I want to clarify this. They were valued, 
by their parents, but they had no value. That is to say, uh, they could produce nothing. They were completely and utterly dependent. And so if we're going to focus on one thing about it being a child, Jesus says, humble, whoever humbles himself like a child, humility, that is, I am completely and utterly dependent on God. So that's what he's talking about with a child. Now, when he says this, he's saying, these are the people who make it into the kingdom of God, those who are completely and utterly dependent on God, who don't have any status, don't have any worth, don't have any value. They don't say, oh, here, God, let's make a good exchange. I'm going to give you me. And, you know, you give me the kingdom of God. Uh, there, there is none of that. Uh, we come to God with open hands as children come to their fathers. Okay. You're with me. I hope you're with me. And I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, though it always does. And I don't understand. Then in verse five, he says, whoever receives one such child. Now he's talking about a disciple. In other words, when you come across another human who is humble, completely and utterly dependent on God, we are called to receive them. So especially, especially the quartet of the vulnerable. You remember the quartet of the vulnerable? The widow, the orphan, the poor, and the foreigner. And to this, I want to make, you know, when it comes to politics, some of you are going to have troubles with that last one. And some of you are going to have trouble with the, the widow, orphan, and poor because you want to outsource it. Well, I voted the right way. No, no, no. You care for the poor, the widow, the orphan. You can't outsource that. I have trouble with all four. I don't like it. Um, probably because I'm selfish and greedy and stuff like that. So on the one hand, we're called to show hospitality with, to eat with the, those who are disenfranchised, those who are poor, those who are um, completely and utterly dependent on God through us. Okay. So that's on the one hand. And then you have this word that's translated, causes one of these little ones to sin. And uh, it's a word that I very much want to translate, you know, ensnare or entrap. And I'll get to this in a second. You know, beware of ensnaring and entrapping other people. And then beware of ensnaring or trapping yourself. And it's, it's this phrase, you know, if your right hand, if your hand or foot or eye causes you to sin... And I, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only person who thinks this, but it sure makes a whole lot better if we translate the verb the same way we translate the noun, uh, which is a snare or a trap. At least that's how I think it should be translated, because this makes so much more sense to me. You know, you're walking through the forest and your foot falls into a bear trap and you can die of starvation and save your foot or you can hack your foot off and continue with your journey if anything stops you from following jesus you better get rid of it or you know let's say you're hiking by yourself in the middle of of nowhere and you know a rock jams your arm your hand into a wedge and there's nothing you can do to get away from there and 127 hours later uh, you know you cut off your hand to preserve your life See, that picture, that analogy makes an awful lot of sense to me. You know, if there's anything that's stopping you from following Jesus where you're like, I want that, but that prevents me from doing what Jesus tells me to do. I can't have both. That makes sense to me. And we're not supposed to do that to other people as well. You know, put them in a situation where, hey, me or Jesus? Don't do that. And, and here's the here's the thing between the transition between verses nine and ten. Okay, pay attention to this. You know, don't let anything stop you from following Jesus. You know, leave your hand, your foot, your eye, anything that stops you from following Jesus. Yes, but what do you do for those who go astray, who have stopped following Jesus? Verse ten. Do not despise one of these little ones. And again, little ones, 
children is Jesus code for a disciple. That is one who is completely and utterly dependent on Jesus. He says, you know, as, as one out of a hundred sheep goes astray, the, the shepherd is going to hunt down that sheep and bring that sheep home. And, and every time I read this, I go, oh, oh, for a congregation where only one out of a hundred goes astray, I could handle that. Uh, so the, the only way I can handle that is if we do this together, and this is where the rubber's going to hit the road here in, in a little bit. Uh, but he says, go and search, go and search. So I, I, I hope you're catching the logic of this whole section, what Jesus is after, okay? Because we've had, you know, greatness is being completely and utterly dependent on God like a child. Don't let, don't, don't cause anyone else to trip up and be ensnared to, and stop them from following Jesus. Don't let anything stop you from following Jesus and go after the stray, go after the lost, okay? Don't leave that to your pastor, Please partner with me in this and work together with me in this, you know, on your own and together. And that's where he then transitions in verse 15 to if your brother or sister sins. And, you know, there's a question of whether it's just sins or sins against you. You know, as far as you can look at my last video where we talk about textual variations in the Bible. And there's one here. So this is what Jesus means. You know, when someone gets caught up in a sin that's preventing them from following Jesus, we're to go after them and say, hey, this is stopping you, you know, your alcoholism, your gossip, your, uh, your adultery, your worldliness, your children, your spouse, they're stopping you from following Jesus. And Jesus says, if they listen to you, you have won your brother or sister. And then you partner up and you go together and you give testimony and say, hey, look, this is stopping you from following Jesus. Notice that this is the seeking Jesus is talking about in the previous section of what Jesus means when one goes astray. Okay? It is they're caught in a sin that's stopping them from following Jesus. And you can stop following Jesus even if you're in worship every single Sunday, which is going to be another issue of, you know, how do we do this whole, you know, go and show them your sin. And it's like, uh, what am I supposed to do? And then we get, uh, this is amazing, because this is the Office of the Keys in 1818. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And the binding is saying to a person, look, as long as you do not turn from your sin, you are under God's wrath. You're under God's condemnation. You are not saved. You are not part of God's kingdom. The loosing of the sin is to say, hey, your sin is no longer there. It's forgiven. It's gone. It's released from you. Okay? That, that's what all our job is, not just pastors. At least that's the way I read it. Uh, Lutherans, at least certain kinds of Lutherans, have gotten all caught up, all, all hung up on only the pastor. It's like, no, 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 not only the pastor. We authorize people to do it on Sunday mornings the pastor or elders or other people, uh, but we're all authorized to do this and called to do this for each other. And then he says this amazing thing in verses 19 and 20. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them also. And this is, I think, perhaps the most misquoted out of context verse in the whole Bible. And it's always quoted in something not having to do with what Jesus is talking about. It's always quoted in a situation where we expected a lot of people and not that many showed up. So we expected 40 and 10 people showed up and then we go, well, where two or three are gathered in his name. It's like, okay, well, that, that's fine, but that's not what Jesus meant. He meant literally two or three. As in, when you go and 
reach to restore a person to faith in Jesus Christ. Say, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. When you agree on that, and when you gather for that purpose of restoring a person to faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus is there with you. When you're in the act of restoring a person, turn from sin, turn to Jesus, there's Jesus. And if you agree on that, uh, God is going to God is going to give you what you want or something like that. But that's also in the context of binding and loosen. God's going to be right there agreeing. And then Peter says, uh, Lord, how often will I uh, forgive my brother? Now, I was told this, and I haven't verified it, but apparently the, the Pharisees or the Jews at some point, and I'm assuming this is like second, third century that this comes from, uh, but apparently they would say, oh, you, you forgive three times, and then, then you're off the hook. And that's where I, where that's the principle I subscribe to. You know, it's like three strikes, you're out. Because I'm that kind of guy. And Peter goes, they say three, I'm going to double it and add one. How about seven times? And here we have a, I don't know how they did numbers back then. You know, this, is Jesus saying 77 times or 70 times seven? And I have no idea. Uh, my wife is currently asking well, is it 77 times or is it 490 times? And is that is that 77 times in the lifetime or 77 times a day? Because she's looking at me going, I'm already up to 73 today. How many more times am I supposed to forgive him today? Yeah, that, that was an attempt at a joke. Uh, Jesus tells this parable, and I hope the parable is obvious. You know, the difference between this uncompassionate servant and the compassionate servant. Uh, just a note, the the 10,000 talents, uh, there's a question of whether is that talents of silver or talents of gold? But I'm going to go with, this is about 6,000 days, days wages, or if you will, 6,000 days worth of food. This is, and that's time, 6,000 times 10,000. So if you can calculate, you know, how much money do you spend on food in a day to feed yourself and then multiply that by 6,000 and then multiply that by 10,000 and see how much money that is and see if you could ever repay that. Okay. And then the, the, the hundred denarii, that would be like a hundred days worth of food. This is not an insubstantial sum of money when we're talking about forgiving our brother or sister, all right? And so when Jesus says, so also will my heavenly father do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And when he says, forgive your brother from your heart, he's talking about a hundred days worth of food or a hundred days wages. This is not some insignificant thing he's talking about forgiving. He's saying, look, I forgave you 10,000 times 6,000 days wages, maybe you want to forgive other people too. And here's where the rubber hits the road. So when it comes to other people, there's a few things that I'm seeing here. And again, this is the shaky ground that I want to be a part of a conversation. We are called to be a forgiving people, not a record-keeping people of by the way, you are on sin 463. Here are the wrongs you've done to me in the last six months. Do you remember what you did to me when I was a child? Do you remember what you did to me? Uh, where we have this laundry list of wrongs that a person have done to each other. And I, when I'm talking to couples, the, I, when someone starts doing this, I, you know, I say, you know, you're, you're, you're laundry listing now, okay? Uh, and you're bringing up old garbage, Okay, either forgive or don't forgive. Uh, but if you don't forgive, we're going to have to have a little come to Jesus moment here. But we are a forgiving people, but we're also a reconciling people. You know, we, we don't just say, well, I don't like that person. And well, that person did such and such to me. Uh, we, we don't have the option of being not reconciled. We are obligated in Christ Jesus. And here again, I feel like I'm pointing the finger. It's like, this is what God did for us. 
why, why are we holding on to bitterness? Why are we holding on to grudges? You know, it's like, but I like making myself miserable. I, I like just that feeling of bitterness. It just gives me these warm, fuzzy feelings inside. Why do we do this to ourselves? And the answer is, well, because that person's a jerk. Like, you don't know what that person did to me. No, I don't. But it's not optional for Christians. Just not optional. You know, I you can pray the Lord's Prayer and say, you know, forgive us our sins. And lead us not into temptation. You can pray the Lord's Prayer that way. Uh, we are restoring people. We are people who seek the lost. And again, don't leave that to me. So, you know, rubber, rubber hits the road. Okay, so what I want you to think about is, you know, over the next year or two or three, I want you to think about the people that God wants to reach with the gospel through us as a King of Glory family. Okay, now who are these people? The answer is, they're, they're the people who, who are already here. He wants us to reach. They're the people who have left uh, and, and are not in another congregation. You know, if they've moved on to a different congregation, so be it. If they're not under our spiritual care anymore. Uh, but if they're people who have just drifted away, we're called to reach out to them. Uh, you know, how do we do that? Who are these people that God wants to reach with the gospel in the next year or two or three? You know, think 2023, 2025, something like that. You know, over the next few years, who does God want us to reach? And the answer is those who are here, those who have drifted away, and those who are within our immediate context, those who are part of our circle of influence or circle of love or extended family, however you want to put that. So what, what does that actually look like practically? And again, I, I want to make sure I'm not wagging the finger at you, but just saying, God in Christ loved you. Don't you love the people around you? Yes? I mean, don't you want them to experience the fullness of God's grace and love and mercy? So what, what does that look like? Uh, just as far as our, our own congregation, it means looking around and saying, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. Now, let me be clear about this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use the word clan and group or family. Okay. You can have something like 50 people in your tribe. Not enough tribe. Clan. You can have like 50 people in your clan that, you know, you know their name, you know their face, you say hi. Uh, you might know a little bit about them, but you don't really know them. But you have about 10 people, you know. And if you're my mom, maybe it's more like 20 or 30 people where you know what time they went to the bathroom this morning. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, you, you know where they work. Uh, you know how long they have you know, been married, you know the names of their children, uh, you, you know where they live, you've been over their house, you eat with them, uh, you know, people who are part of kind of your inner circle, okay? And so when you see someone who, who hasn't been here for a while, maybe they never had an inner circle, and, but they're a part of your clan, they're a part of your 50, and what does it mean? It means picking up the phone and saying, hey, you know what? It's been two years since I've seen you. I, or I don't remember the last time I saw you, but hey, I miss you. I recognize you're gone, okay? It, it means sending them a text, sending them an email, you know, whatever works for you and more importantly, whatever works for them. It means picking up the phone, text, email. Uh, it means sending them a card. It means, it, it means, uh, following up and it's like, hey, can, can we just get together for, for coffee or something? Because, uh, you know, I, I care about you, okay? Not inviting them back to worship, not inviting them to Bible study, but just saying, hey, I miss you. And hey, can we get together in a non-threatening way? And again, this isn't me telling you what to do or how to do it. It's me throwing stuff out there for conversation, okay? Chances are you are already relationally saturated and you're like, how do I have time for this? I get it. I get it. Uh, but but we're family. God has brought us together. 
when when people when people that are here in worship that you don't recognize, and especially especially if they sit near you. So this is my thing with the, you know, the 10 versus the clan, you know, maybe you don't know the person who used to sit way across on the other side, but if they used to sit somewhat near you, if you're recognizing that they're gone, that's a good thought to say, Hey, pick up the phone. Okay. Again, if they've already moved on to another congregation, they're not under our spiritual care, but if they drifted away, you recognize they're gone. So what do you do for a person who's sitting next to you within a pew or two of you? What do you do for them? Before worship, if you'd go up and say, hey, you know, I don't recognize you or I forgot your name. Don't say, don't say, are you new here? Been here longer than you. Uh, no, you just say, hey, you know what? I, I don't recognize you or I, I can't remember if I've met you before. My name is Steve. Before worship, after worship, and, you know, find out where they're from, you know, make a little bit of small talk, make them feel welcome. Just say, hey, glad, glad to see that you're here. And, and then when it comes to fellowship hour, you know, hey, join us in the back for some cookies. Uh, join us for some coffee, you know, and, and be inviting. And again, next step is, hey, I would love to get together with you. All right. Or just as good. And he's like, oh, you drive a Harley Davidson? I know someone, I don't know anybody who drives a Harley, uh, but whatever, you know, try to connect them to a, another person. All right. I, I had another note here. And, and this has to do with two more things, uh, two more things. Uh, one has to do with uh, verbal confession and verbal absolution. Okay. <clears throat> and this one's a killer. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to say something off the wall here for a second, but I want you to notice about verbal confession. Uh, when I talk about this, people are like, oh, I confess to God. And the catechism, you know, I don't, I don't know if Luther wrote the fifth chief part or not, <clears throat> but the emphasis in, in there is on uh, confessing your sins to your pastor. You know, if you have a sin that's really burdening you, you have a sin that's just entrapped you and ensnared you and you can't get away from it, confess that sin verbally to another human being. And the catechism emphasizes the pastor. I would emphasize a brother or sister in Christ. And if that's me, that's me. If it's someone else in the congregation, we have to be in a place where we know how to confess our sins and say, hey, I'm really struggling with but why don't we do that? So let me say something off the wall. You know, do I want to admit that over the last year I've been committing adultery with some woman? Do I want to admit that? Um, I'm not, by the way, committing adultery with some woman. Uh, but if I were, no, no, no. Well, I confess it to God. I'm dealing with it on my own. God works through means. And there's something powerful about confessing your sin to another human being that's not there when you confess it to God. There's something that keeps the sin secondhand in arm's length away from you, where it's like, yeah, I'm doing that, but it's not really me and I'm dealing with it versus <clears throat> I've, been con con I've been doing this horrible, awful thing. And hearing... Hearing your, you say that to another human, it makes the sin real. It makes the sin awful. It makes the sin disgusting. And you don't want to admit it because you really don't want to admit that this is who you are. And because you don't really want to deal with the sin. So there's something powerful about a verbal confession to another human being. And we don't want to do it because we don't want advice. We don't want to be judged. We don't want to be condemned. We want to be forgiven. And we're embarrassed. But think about what it does. It's, it's honesty versus wearing a mask. It's having integrity rather than hypocrisy. Where, you know, we say, oh, I'm this poor, miserable sinner. But in reality, what are we? Uh, it's the difference between humility and admitting who we are, you know, as 
who are miserable sinners as children completely dependent on God versus being whitewashed to him and pretending like we're something that we in fact are not because we don't confess our sins to others. It, it makes it real and makes it felt and known. Both the, both the confession part of the sin, it makes the sin real and it makes the forgiveness real. And it's the forgiveness that enables us to, to really conquer that sin or for God to conquer it in us. It's that reality of the sin and the reality of the forgiveness. Otherwise, you know, it becomes an abstraction, something that we keep at arm's length. And then there's also a certain amount of accounting for, of saying, hey, you know what, uh, friend, brother or sister in Christ, I'm really struggling with this. I want to account for it in my life. I want you to ask me every week, hey, did you look at the website you're not supposed to look at? Uh, did you gossip this week? Uh, did you self-medicate this week? I want you to ask me that question because I, I need to know that you're going to ask because that's going to help me not do it. Uh, otherwise, we just put it off. We don't deal with the sin. Okay. That's my little speech. And again, the, the whole purpose of all of this is God works through means. And sin is really bad. Why do we want, why do we not want to deal with it? And the answer is because we don't want to deal with it, <sighs> which is really sad. All right. Then final thing, uh, with the forgiveness part, it, it made me think of the practice of the one another passages of the New Testament. We covered this when I first got here a year ago. And, and it's all those passages that say, you know, be kind to one another, bear one another, bear with one another, uh, build up one another, be patient with one another, encourage one another, partner together, instruct one another. All these things we are to do for one another because we are the family of Christ, because that's what God in Christ did for us. And you can't do the one another thing unless you're actually, you know, you got a one and you got another and you're doing this for each other. And I say this because I spent so much of my life alone, so much not having people partnering with me, so many people not encouraging me, so many people not building me up. And so, you know, just from a personal point of view, I mean, there's two words, you know, the partnership word and the encouragement word that I so desperately need for myself i'm going wow for me who has such blessing from god and being surrounded by such good people if i need that what does everybody else need and so i think about this in terms of forgiveness because it's dealing with the my own sin dealing with the corruption of this world dealing with the the old evil foe that i cannot do this alone we need each other and so, you know, if you want to keep arm's length from me and other people in the church, and it's like, well, I just want to show up for worship. I go, well, that's fine. The rest of us, the rest of us need to partner together in the gospel because that's what God called us to do. That's the only way we can defeat the devil and the world and our sinful flesh. It's the only way is together to, to, to make a difference in our own lives and the lives of those around us. Uh, again, this is what God in Christ did for us. Don't we want that for one another? Yes, yes. I, I hope this wasn't finger wagging judgment, but wow, you know, I really want to live this out. You know, yes. All right. God's peace be with you. Uh, no, there's something I'm supposed to say. Uh, I'm supposed to pray. You know, hell, Heavenly Father, we ask that we would help us to live in this forgiveness for ourselves and for others. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.